Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Depends upon where you are in this world. My part of the world is Miami, Florida. I'm Captain Bill Gustin with Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department. Here with my esteemed guests who they can introduce themselves. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Key. That's keypose.com. It's an easy endorsement for me. Uh, if you want to put your uh, fire hose to the test, give it to the uh, training division and it will be dragged across pavement and over windowsills, through buildings every day, almost all day. And uh, the key hose, every grade that they have, uh, starting with their combat ready, uh, but also their true ID hose, both 2.25 and 2.5. If you've never had your hands on it, and you're thinking about uh, acquiring new hose for your department, please contact Key and uh, get a keyhose.com and get get a few, as they say in the hose business, a few sticks for you to try out. So our topic today is going to be houses of worship. And what we'll do is kind of like an around about fashion here. Uh, we'll start with uh, Chief Jason, a little bit about, just a little bit about yourself because you're a regular. And uh, uh, any experience you've had uh, with churches and uh, maybe a lesson learned uh, or a mistake you made that you're willing to share with us. Yeah, I'm Jason Holman, Fire Chief at the Forest and Valley Fire Protection District in St. Louis County and also co-owner of Engine House Training. Um, I've been fortunate. I've not had a lot of church fires. Um, I've had a handful over the years, both as a volunteer and as paid. Um, but all of them, if there's one common theme, is they've all been stubborn. Uh, they've all surprised us. And they've required an enormous amount of resources. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the ones that I've been on. And, and the other key that I've learned recently is our traditional idea of what a place of worship is is has changed dramatically over the years we respond to places of worship in strip malls in old retail buildings um, in what used to be apartment buildings um, anything that in anywhere they can put them that's where we're finding these these documents jason i've got some good pictures of that of the storefront church and it used to be a liquor store and a bar so um now that's not to say that you couldn't worship in a liquor store or a bar. I, I know some people do. Uh, I think Dan is the 10 there. Uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dan, as long as I've got you on, on there, uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit about churches? Sure. Uh, Dan Shaw. Uh, I'm Vice President of Traditions Training, also Deputy Chief with Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department uh, in Fairfax, Virginia. And, um, you know, fortunately, like Jason said, I think you know church fires are not a high category of fires we run <clears throat> or places of worship fires and i'm glad we we made that delineation between that two because i think that's a slippery slope to learn anything from some of those fires it is delineated between what is a church and what is a place of worship because you know the ornamental large old structure we envision as the church is vastly different than uh, the movie cinema that is running on sundays they do a service at or specifically when you talk about experience you know, the last church fire I was on uh, was a double wide trailer. It was two double wide trailers slapped together that they put a, uh, across the end of it and put some pews in it, called a church. Uh, and and to, to your point, it goes back to a lot of what we see in line of duty deaths and close calls. When you see some of the things that don't go well is typically the application of residential tactics to a commercial building or to a different structure. And that's that slope. You, know, you pull up and it's a house uh, that is converted to uh, a place of worship, or in this case, a trailer, you think, yeah, it's a trailer, nothing to it. You're not expecting this large fuel load. You're not expecting pews that are going to inhibit your ability to advance a line. You're not ex expecting wide open spaces. So uh, it's it's always important all the time when we arrive at fires and we're making that size up or we're taking that lap is, you know, those telltale signs of things are telling you what type of occupancy this is and how that dictates what your action should be, you know, your strategy and tactics. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out to Chief uh, Frank Lieb, L-E-E-B of the FBNY. Uh, and I wanna encourage all of you to uh, go to the fire engineering website. He has an excellent podcast with uh, Joe Pernesti from uh, Ohio. And uh, in preparation for this, 
uh, hangout today. I did indeed watch it. It takes about an hour. Uh, and the man has extensive experience with the traditional, what he calls the Gothic church, with the rose window that's up in the gable. Uh, he gets it, and uh, a lot of valuable lessons learned. So again, that's going to be a podcast uh, with uh, Frank Lieb, Chief Frank Lieb, and Joe Pernesti on the Fire Engineering uh, website. And might even be on Firefighter Nation as well. Bill Carey or Peter, if you're there, I know you were going to post some kind of link to that. So, uh, again, I would uh, definitely, that's a must see the uh, podcast on church fires, uh, houses of worship uh, with Frank Lee. Uh, James Johnson, sir, you are, our, you are our de facto impromptu heavy timber subject matter expert coming from the uh the northwest so as i said to bill earlier i am immediately skeptical of any time someone says they're an expert on anything so uh so leave that out but uh it's kind of funny actually with uh what uh what chief shaw and chief holman said um that's kind of my thoughts when when he sent me the email um, is a lot of times when people think church, they're thinking that, you know, heavy timber um, or, um, you know, post and beam, some kind of big structure. Um, and when you look at different size up models where people are saying, I've got so in, you know, this type of church during their size up, uh, it can be anything like they're, like we're talking about. It could be a strip mall, it could be um, any kind of type of building. So that's a, uh, um, you know, I think that the I think the church fires in those big heavy timber buildings are probably you know fewer and far between than than some of the other um, places of worship. So that's kind of funny how we all kind of had the same same thoughts right off the bat. Well, you know, it's it's and we don't collaborate on this, guys. You know, you know that our, our viewers may not realize it. We don't. We never collaborate on this. And the, the pictures are going to be uncanny with uh, the storefront church that I, I'm going to show you. Sam Hill, a little bit about yourself and experience with church fire. I'm a captain with Wichita Fire, and um, you know, like like the panel, uh, don't have extensive um, experience with church fires. It seems like the uh, more stubborn ones we get are uh, lightning strikes um, rather than accidental. Um, they get away from us. Um, they get well involved before they show themselves, and we'll talk about those construction features as to why that happens. I'm sure. Uh, as far as personal experience, um, you just can't go arbitrarily taking things down. Um, for instance, one of the last ones we did uh, cut a tree down so we could get negative, try to get ahead of it in the sanctuary, found out that tree had significant importance to that church. Um, I actually had a chief try to uh, write me up over it. And I want to throw this up on the table right now. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick so that we can... Uh, there we go. Is that coming up? Oh, there we go. Okay, so this this is something that we don't always talk about too. Um, that's going to become more prevalent with church fires. Um, throughout the uh, throughout the world, we're seeing a decline in church attendance, which means we have a lot of vacant churches. So when we look at not only the uh, fatality rate per fire in churches is a little bit higher than other fires, but then we add in the fact that abandoned fires or abandoned building fires also put us in a greater danger. Um, combine the two and you can have some serious issues because now you're gonna have a lot more fires spread a lot quicker with that dilapidation. You know, uh, Sam, uh, I'm from the Chicago area, not right in the city of Chicago. Uh, my daughter lives in Cincinnati and these older cities, you know, every, there's, so many parishes, you know, in the parish, they actually folks, instead of identifying themselves with a, uh, with a specific neighborhood, they will identify themselves with a parish. And there are old, like for instance, in Cincinnati, there are tons of old, beautiful churches. And um, sadly, there, a lot of them are being attended uh, just by old people that are uh, not being replaced. Uh, so you made an excellent point, uh, and I appreciate that, Sam. Um, let me just go through a couple pictures here. What you're looking at 
is an electrical panel. On the first floor of a two-story church, the second floor is a Sunday school. Uh, Vincent Dunn speaks uh, quite a bit about um, inside size up and outside size up. Uh, here, they the call uh, called in is an electrical fire. Uh, obviously, an electrical panel involved. First arriving company officer, a sharp guy, shut off the electricity. It had a uh, it, uh, been upgraded up. Believe it or not. And he shut off the outside uh, uh, main electrical uh, shut off and knocked down the fire and advised the chief that the uh, chief, we've got it knocked down. Looks like it's under control. But as Chief Dunn says, there's two size ups at every fire. And what the chief, the incident commander at the time, am I holding this up correctly? Yeah. Uh, says, oh no. You've got, uh, can you see that pretty well, guys? You have, you have uh, fire and smoke coming out of the uh, eaves. So I think I have that correct. Okay. There you go. Got worse. And you see that guy going up the stairs. Uh, he and another firefighter. In fact, those two guys on the stairs. Uh, got trapped by iron bars on the second floor, and uh, it was uh, a nasty situation. That was several years ago. Now, I have never used this on a church, but I've used it on buildings with rain roofs. So I'm applying what I do know to something that I don't know, okay, to be, to be honest. But this works with a rain roof, and what I'm referring to with a rain roof is one roof that is built over another, either for aesthetic purposes or so you don't have to vacate the building by ripping off the original roof. Okay. If we can get a hole in a roof where we have a fire in a massive attic, we can put a sprinkler in that in that attic, a very effective one, something like this. Now, I was looking at a friend of mine sent me a, a, a chart on these things. Depending upon the pressure, you can get some of these to flow as much as 500 gallons a minute. And you know you're going to be effective because the water, if there is any kind of uh, eaves, the water will gush out. I want to caution you, though, when you put that amount of water into an attic, uh, you're running the risk of collapsing the ceiling due to the weight of the water. So that's just uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, you could not have been more correct on the storefront church. Uh, here's uh, they're setting up an aerial device in a uh, on the Fourth of July. Uh, this was a bar and liquor store. It is now a church. So um, and it was very well involved. So you can see that the aerial apparatus is spotting in a corner safe area. And the guys start to stretch the line. Now can you see up in here a dangerously? high, inherently unstable parapet that goes across to the other occupancy. Now, as Vincent Dunn says in his video on facades, uh, they collapse like a giant stone wave. So my boss, Todd Garafalo, gets on the scene and sees this, and these guys are doing the best they can. But they're kind of dialed in on what they're doing, and he puts an end to it. And there you see that they're he moved them out of the collapse zone. Now, what's interesting about this is the uh, our investigator has a uh, access to a a small front end loader, and he wanted to push that parapet in so he could get into the building without having to worry about it falling on him. And he could not push the parapet in. And then as he backed up the front front end loader, he inadvertently caught the shovel uh, on the parapet and pulled that entire thing down, very similar to a uh, when you make that mistake with a tower ladder, when you fail to raise the basket before you retract. So, um, but it crashed like a giant stone, stone wave. And with this type of uh, construction, uh, if you were standing on the sidewalk in front of a uh, the adjoining occupancy, you would still get nailed by that collapsing uh, parapet wall. Uh, I've got a couple more here. 
small church, uh, fire in the attic. Uh, the guys got up and made quick work with a vent. And as you can see, that's a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy that they are dissipating. Right? They're getting rid of that energy. Uh, and you can see quite the difference once we've created uh, that, that uh, unidirectional flow. But remember, and all the studies support this, especially with UL, venting without fire suppression makes the fire worse, not better. So in short order, we see this. So the vent did its job. These guys did their job, but it was timed very well with the uh, companies advancing uh, two and a half inch lines into this church. So kudos to these guys. So um, James, uh, the, the, the church that I grew up in, uh, that I attended, that my uh, sisters were married in, uh, I had my first communion and confirmation, um, was a, a target of an arsonist, uh, which a lot of church fires are. And very sad, this was in Wheaton, Illinois. And, um, you know, for years I was looking at this magnificent structure and it was built in the early, early 60s. And of course, exposed beam, but at that time it was Blue Lamb. Uh, the, the pews were, uh, I believe, oak. And uh, because of the accelerants used, uh, nothing short of a fireboat would have put this thing out. And it was absolutely just a uncontrollable fire. And um, I know we talk a lot about heavy timber, not necessarily blue lamb, but nowadays that's mostly what we're going to see, James. Uh, can you touch on this theory that we don't have that much to be concerned about with these, these heavy timbers because, or mass lumber, if you want to call it, because they're hard to ignite or that they will form some kind of refractory <clears throat> char on the surface. Can you touch on that for a bit? Yeah, so that um, what that comes from is a bunch of the testing um, that they did with the International Code Council when they were going to code for the new mass timber buildings. And so they did a bunch of, they formed like an ad hoc committee and that committee was, uh, was uh, appointed to figure out um, do some testing and figure out what limits they could go with the heavy timber. So they did a bunch of testing and and all the testing that they did with uh, the heavy or with the mass timber, which is a sen essentially um, much like glue laminated timber where it's boards that are put together, except for instead of being stacked vertically into a beam, they're horizontally into a panel basically. And, uh, and what they found is as it would burn, it would, um, they would create a char layer and that char layer would essentially insulate some of the material on the inside. So that, that's good in theory, um, but it all depends on, um, there's so many factors, depends on what the fuel load is in the building, uh, depends on what the ventilation tract is. Um, there's so many things that kind of come into play with that. But if you are burning, say a glue lamp beam with a single source and you and you're igniting just that beam um, it will eventually um, kind of insulate itself and and uh, but as long as you have other fuel sources like room the contents and the structure um, it's a different situation so we're talking about that we're talking about um, you know a, a self self uh, sustaining uh, piece of lumber that's on fire or a system that's on fire as opposed to you know all the stuff that you'd find in one of these places of worship like the the pews and and all the other stuff so um and something you mentioned with that the age of that church um there's been huge uh advances in glue laminated timber um there a lot of the adhesives have been um have been changed and updated so they perform really well um some of the older ones there was issues with um as it as the beam would burn through the bottom courses of it or the bottom laminations would delaminate a little bit early. Um, so a lot of it comes down to the era of the, of the materials as well and how they'll perform. Yeah, um, I know there's a lot of talk about that. Again, I wanna give that shout out to Chief Lieb. Um, he also talks about the, um, 
I believe it was in Pittsburgh where they had a, a, a multiple line of duty death with the collapse of a, a steeple. And of course, we saw that at that fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral. And uh, which I, I'm still completely mystified how a, a world, not even a national treasure, how a world treasure like that could not be better uh, protected with a, at least a, a, a uh, a more responsive, a, a more effective uh, uh, warning of some kind of alarm system of some kind. My gosh! Um, but what a you know what a shame. And when you lose something like that, it's uh, you don't get it back. So and it really the impact that I I saw. Now I was no longer living in that area, but you know that's a heartbreaker. Uh, people grow up uh, around a church, and it's their culture, and uh, this is where they get married that's if you're catholic it's where you have your first communion and and confirmation and then you bury your relatives or, or have funerals right there and it becomes a part of your family and part of the community so a loss of a church is a is devastating to the community uh in many ways now i'm a knucklehead because i got my cell phone in my pocket here and it went off so hopefully luckily it's none of you guys calling me up here, let me cross it across the room so you won't hear it. Here it is, by the way. Let's see who's calling me. Oh, it's my son. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. I'm doing the hangout. I'll call you back, okay? All right. Uh, sweet flip phone you got there, Bill. Pardon me? That's a sweet flip phone you got there. Hey, hey, I'll tell you what, my son got me that. It is the same cell phone that the department issues to our battalion chiefs. Did so you trade in your bag phone for that? Games and all that stuff. <laughs> I just need to be able to, all I want is something that if I could get a dial on that, I would. All I want is something that I can call people up and receive calls. That's all I need. Is That, that wasn't a jitterbug, was it? Like with the three buttons, like, you know, home, hospital, 911? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just like this thing I got around my neck. If I fall, I'm not getting up. I gotta press this button. Hey, I'm not far from it. So, I like um, name this kid Bill so he can remember his name. Oh, <laughs> uh, so I the point you made about the the occupancy. You know, look, when we were responding on that uh, that that storefront church with the parapet that uh, eventually collapsed. In your mind's eye. You're thinking church, and I'm thinking, listen, I'm familiar with that area. We're going in on the second alarm, and I'm thinking, I can't think of a church in that that neighborhood. And so the point is well taken that it could be a different kind of building, and um, you know, depending upon the neighborhood, it could be like you say, it could be a gas station, it could, it could have been a convenience store or something like that. So. Um, well, Bill, you make a good point. Like it, 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 that's one of those things that really stresses the importance of you having some relationship uh, with code officials. You know, and, and obviously, even represented on this podcast um, or hangout is you know, depending upon the size of your department. Uh, if you're in a metro department, you know, they have a lot of structures to deal with. They're smaller, you might have a more intimate relationship with them. But you know, I, I have seen it in where I've worked over my career is demographically. Uh, some of our lower income, some of the immigrant populations, they had a lot of places of worships, a lot of places that, you know, were houses that were converted. You know, we're, we're not getting a notification from our code enforcement people telling us there's a change of occupancy. We're finding out the same way you're finding it out, which is you get dispatched to such and such for a church. I'm like, well, that, that street's full of residential houses. How's that a church? Uh, and that's why it's really important to have some measure of relationship to know if Hey, there's a change of occupancy that really is stark. Uh, it goes from liquor store to church. Uh, it's always beneficial for us to be in the mix and have an idea of what exactly is changing and then be able to get out of the firehouse, go and look at it, see what the changes are, and then start building that strategy long before you ever get dispatched for that fire to see what happens uh, and, and what, your, what your plan is of attack for it and what you're going to face. I mean, God knows you were on pull up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and now you're facing something you didn't even think about at all and have no experience with. Dan, it's an assembly occupancy. And in many assembly occupancies, all but the first door, the front doors, actually in a church, uh, Frank Lee talked about this. 
when we consider the front of a church, that would be the alpha side we pull up on, but that's not actually the front of the church. I think you call that the sacristy when you first go in. The altar is the front of the church where we would consider the Charlie side from the street many times. So, um, but we need to remember that um, that type of situation, especially in, an, in a neighborhood where crime might be a problem, the only doors that are going to be accessible and can be used to enter and, and exit are going to be the front doors. And guys, it's not going to be a fire. Chances are it won't be a fire. It, it is going to be a perceived, just happened in Texas, didn't it? A perceived or real gunshot, active shooter. And we're going to have a stampede. And fire officers, when you're trying to relate to people about fire, a lot of them can't conceptualize that there could ever be a fire. But they get that you could have a real or perceived active shooter. And when you only have one way out of a building with a bunch of people, you're looking at a lot of people being trampled and crushed to death in a stampede. And um, so, Dan, you're, with you, you're spot on in that respect. So, and also, don't you feel, I'm just going to raise this question to all of you. I'm not saying your department does it. I'm not saying you do it. But we know historically in the past, uh, fire departments have given breaks to um, churches and sometimes schools that, um, are affiliated with churches, if you think back in history. And um, nobody wants to penalize a, a church and cause them a, uh, an expense. But um, do you think, you know, historically, and I know, Sam, you are quite a, a student of his, history when it comes to uh, firefighting and fire protection. Can you think of a situation where that has happened in the past, where the fire department has not been quite as strident or stringent with fire code enforcement, and it turned out to be a, uh, a big mistake? Yeah, there was a uh, long time ago, there was a school in Texas that burned down, um, killed some kids. And so when they rebuilt the school, they put a sprinkler system in it. They were very, very, very proud of this sprinkler system. They brought the community in, um, they showed it off. And then that town ended up growing. And when they added on to the school and went to tie into that sprinkler system, they realized that it had never been connected. You know, John Norman talks about that in his book, uh, Fire Officer's Handbook of Tactics, where um, an inspector will come in and they'll look at the static pressure on the base of a riser, Sam. Oh, that's good. 75 PSI. Okay, that's good. Yeah. It's hooked up to the domestic water. It's not even connected. So, you know, that's why, that, especially with a sprinkler system. Um, but, you know, and Bill, to your point, that you, just another angle to hit that at, too, is, is I think Sammy talked about before, or you're talking about abandoned churches, you see this decrease in attendance in the places of worship, uh, which essentially means for most religions, uh, a decrease in attendance means less money you have coming in. Yes. If they're spending less money. What do you think they're not, they're not going to spend it on? Yeah. some measure of fire protection or you know, any, yeah. any of those other things that would benefit us, you, you're going to see that missing from the mix. And it's not always obvious back to that, you know, what you're talking about, especially now, you know, your ch a church itself, when they start doing remodeling, sometimes it's a little bit easier to pick up on. But as a code official in my hometown, I did it for 20 years. I can't tell you how many occupancies that got so much, go, got so far on a project on the interior because of its location, because of what it looked like, because you didn't suspect a church moving into an old car repair shop. Um, and, or if the code official doesn't drive by these locations in some jurisdictions frequent enough, you can miss uh, those things happening. And, and what, and what I've, my personal experience is a lot of these churches, they, they need more room, they need, they need more space, but they can't afford to add on. So they cut up what they have to create more spaces to try to accommodate what they're dealing with. And um, it, it causes a lot of problems from a, you know, accessibility from they don't put the exits in. And a lot of these places have basements. Uh, this last strip mall church fire I had, the 
the sanctuary or the place of worship was in the basement, not on the main floor. Um, and it can get, can get real confusing at times. You know, Jason, uh, if you think about the, the church makes money off of renting out the church hall uh, and the Knights of Columbus meetings and all that. And uh, that's affiliated with the church. Uh, and then you're looking at a different type of occupancy. Both, you know, you, now, now you got a big, uh, you know, you have cooking. Um, Mike Dugan is not with us today. He's uh, got another obligation, but uh, he was telling me yesterday in a phone conversation uh, when he was a uh, uh, a cap, uh, either a lieutenant or a captain on a, a ladder company. He uh, they had a fire in a, a church and made an excellent stop, and it was in a second floor storage area where they stored uh, secondhand clothes for homeless people. So it's always interesting to see, you know, what 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 the building is being used for. Uh, yeah, I'm past the halfway mark here, so I want to give a shout out again to our sponsor, Key. That's KeyHose.com. Uh, again, if you're looking for uh, to replace anything you have, uh, you have to take a look at the Key. Uh, and I, uh, as I mentioned in every one of these hangouts, uh, take the Key Challenge. Try to take their true ID or their combat ready and try to kink it. Try to kink it. Uh, also, consider that we have these these buildings that are uh, high rise buildings. They, they, look, they look big in their footprint, but for exclusivity, that they do is um, divide the building up so that you have uh, you ride your own almost like a personal elevator up to the floor, and you may have two, three, or four uh, apartments, that's it, or condominiums. Uh, and then the only floors that you can go from one section to the next are crossover floors, like the first floor, you know, the third, maybe the 18th, or the 21st. So uh, my point is with the hose is that you're not going to have the benefit of a long hallway to stretch down and flake out your hose on the floor below. So you're going to be forced to somehow lay in a, uh, an apartment on the floor below or lay in what little hallway you have. And if you're gonna do that, uh, or if you're using the dreaded Cleveland load uh, in a coil, uh, Sam, don't say it, don't say it. Sam, you don't wanna insult all the people that live in Cleveland, Ohio about their-, uh, their <laughs> I think he's trying to drag you into something, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but I gotta tell you, you wanna put your hose to the test, Put it in a Cleveland load. Uh, well, remember, you can't stretch it dry, and you have to have inherently kink-resistant hose and fairly high pressures to bump out the potential kinks. So uh, I cannot give a more enthusiastic, enthusiastic endorsement about key. Hey, Bill, I think I think Sam still had one thing he he wanted to mention about the occupancy stuff with uh, with the church fires. And I'll start off by saying our department actually just went to key. Um, well, we just tested it. We're going to move the key hose ourselves. Um, we are rather impressed with it. Uh, the engine guys, that's what they said anyways. So um, anyways, uh, moving forward, uh, one of the things we talked about was um, a lot of these have basements. Um, we talked about occupancy change, but what we haven't discussed is mixed occupancy. Um, and the areas that I work, uh, we're particularly concerned about uh, even our Salvation Army is housing families, displaced families during the evening. And so it's not uncommon for a church to uh, build some temporary rooming in the basement or somewhere in the church for homeless and displaced families, where traditionally we believe that, you know, like a uh, store, it should be pretty much uh, vacant during the evening hours. Uh, we have a very, uh, a very big concern for life hazard during the night hours if the church fire comes in. And it goes back to um, non-conventional footprints, uh, people who are unfamiliar with that footprint when uh, things get smoked up and then access issues as uh, Captain Gustin already mentioned. That's an excellent point. And um, I think we all need to consider that. Um, you know, like soup kitchens, a uh, place uh, for uh, homeless people to come, especially in extremely cold weather. And uh, is the exits, are they open, accessible? Are they all locked except for the front doors? 
Uh, that's a $10,000 question, but it's something that if, uh, if I had a church in my first two district, I certainly would want to know. So excellent point, Sam. Thank you. Um, can we talk about uh, master stream devices. Uh, I think one of the uh, biggest advancements that we've seen in firefighting, fire suppression, uh, over the last few years, 20 years, let's say 20 years, has been the portable master stream. And what I mean by the portable master stream is a device that has one two and a half inch inlet, and uh, it doesn't flow anywhere near as much as the old three inlet multiversal, which weighs, I think, 10 or 12,000 pounds when you take it off the top of the apparatus. Um, and uh, they're quite a quite a heavy piece of equipment. The portable master stream device, um, there's several different brands from several manufacturers, they're all good. And I noticed that uh, there's been improvements over the years in the angle of the stream is that they have somehow calculated hydraulically through the force of nozzle reaction that you can get the stream down lower without losing control of the device. It's amazing what they've done right over the last few years. Uh, Jason, um, the way that you have your um, portable master stream set up in a compartment with uh, uh, a leader line of, I think it's 50 feet of uh, three inch hose, would be absolutely ideal to position in the uh, double front doors of a church uh, for a uh, for fire attack. Can you speak on the way that you have that set up on your apparatus? And was that just one of your rigs or all your puffers set up like that? We've got them all set up like that. And um, curiously, where that came from for us was the Ferguson riots. Uh, when we responded in, uh, when things were really bad, um, not the night everything burned, but leading up to that, when we would have riots and fires, we weren't allowed to connect the hydrants. We weren't, it, it was a totally different operating procedure. And so we, what we ended up doing is we basically would pull up to a house, drop your tank, and then you would leave. And the next truck would come in and do the same thing. So we set up this 50 foot, uh, so at that time, section of two and a half with a, with a nozzle on it. And you would dump your tank that way. And you'd throw it right back in the compart in the uh, driver's side door and get out of there. But what we found was, like you said, the conventional deck guns that we would pull off the top were too heavy. And so we went to these uh, single man, quote unquote, ground monitors, um, which are light, relatively light. They're easy to maneuver. And we, we, uh, we basically make a bundle um, and fold it into the device. And it sits in a compartment on the driver's side uh, behind the pump panel. And we've used it on a handful of fires. It was it was de deployed and, and set up for commercial fires, churches, strip malls mostly, which we have a lot of. Um, and it's worked incredibly well. It, it's fast. Uh, it, on most commercial buildings that we have that we would use it for, 50 feet is plenty. But it's easy to connect another section or two if you need it. Um, and I've got a video I can send to you, Bill, that you can send out or they can link later on. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I think your head's up with that. Um, the advantage, the disadvantage, of course, it doesn't flow as much water as a conventional three inlet uh, monitor. Uh, the advantages over the three inlet monitor is, though, although it flows less water, is you can move it and you're going to have to move it. Uh, the other thing, you're, if you if you are operating 400, 500 gallons a minute up into the overhead, hydraulically penetrating a ceiling to try to get water up into an attic or cock loft, and you're not seeing an appreciable reduction in, in the, the volume of, of, of smoke and pressure of smoke, you're not hitting the fire. Neither there's a, uh, a big air conditioning unit up there or perhaps they've laid plywood across the uh, underside of the uh, rafters or trusses for storage, whatever it is, you're not hitting the seat of the fire. So you're gonna to have to move this thing. But with a three inlet multiversal, it's pretty tough to move with the uh, smaller devices you can. The other thing is, what? how effective is a, uh, a deck gun on a engine uh, a modern fire engine, when you're like 11 feet in the air up in the nosebleed section, if the fire is um, 
in the cock loft uh, of a one-story building, uh, what you're doing is you're directing the trajectory of the screen down on the floor. What we need to do is get down low and get that screen up into the overhead. And I think the church fires, one of our silver bullets, if there is any silver bullet for a church fire, is the portable master screen device. Uh, and, and then when you look at McMansions, these large, large homes, uh, and like I say, just about any commercial occupancy, um, with portable master screen devices are, as I said before, I think they're one of the best advancements that we've seen in uh, in decades. James, uh, I'm not familiar with the way that you operate, uh, but I, I'm still appalled that I see as I go around the, our country, uh, there are departments that still don't have them. And uh, I, I just can't figure that out. Uh, so. If you've never had one, and listen, I'm not endorsing any brand, folks, uh, any model, I'm not. But um, if, if you don't have one in your department, uh, and really, the, the less people you have, the more you need them. Uh, they are um, uh, just an invaluable piece of equipment. So, uh, James, are they widely used in Canada? Yeah, definitely. Um, like in Vancouver, we like all of our ladders are quince. They're all hundred foot, but they all have pumps on them. Uh, so every engine and every and every ladder in the city has one, like a portable on it. Um, and even right from day one, rookie school, um, that's part of our evolutions of of grabbing it and you know fire ahead, fire to the rear, as we call it, and setting up the two and a half. And uh, so it's definitely something that's in our our daily playbook. I've been, uh, now that I'm in the training division, I, I have to find uh, training modules for um, uh, our folks to do and to you know, have a certain amount of continuing education units in order for us to maintain our ISO uh, or classification and our accreditation. So I looked at the uh, Underwriters Laboratories um, Fire Service. Um, Research Institute and uh, looked at their studies on uh, water mapping. In other words, what happens when we direct a stream of water up into the overhead? How much actually falls back? Uh, where does it travel? Uh, cooling the gas layer. And, uh, and I know that there's the European idea is that you have to use some type of water fog in order to absorb those and cool down those gases. Um, if you've never seen these things, uh, they're modules that are available to everybody. Uh, it's research that was done at Underwriters Laboratory in uh, Northbrook, Illinois, in uh, cooperation or collaboration with the Illinois Fire Service uh, Institute. And uh, just excellent things on operating hose streams, cooling the overhead, the reach of the stream, where the water actually goes, how much you really need. And they, of course, hammer in almost every one of these modules. If you're opening up a building and you're not following up with water right away, you're ventilating. And you're ventilating without fire suppression. And this fire is going to get away from you because it's going to be ventilation limited. And a lot of firefighters don't think that just opening a door would be considered ventilation. But you're venting all right. And large buildings and commercial buildings, the chances are if it is a ventilation limited or controlled fire, which almost all fires today are because plastic burn with a voracious appetite for oxygen. So in order for that polymer to convert itself into heat and light energy, it has to have the oxygen. And it will consume that available oxygen so quickly. So what you have when you're pulling up on a church at night, you're pulling up on a a, a workout gym, uh, a liquor store, an auto parts. You basically you may not have any smoke showing at all, because what's happened is the fire has diminished in intensity to the point that it's 
diminished in temperature. And when it diminishes in temperature, it diminishes in the pressure. That that's what we associate with the intensity of a fire. What is the pressure of the smoke coming out of these cracks around doors and windows, uh, or a broken window? Uh, there's a vast difference between smoke that just kind of gently drifts out of a window and smoke that looks like it's coming out of the uh, stack of a steam locomotive. So understand that um, maybe you better take a minute or two more to get your ducks in a row, get your supply lines led, get your appliances ready to go, because what you're going to be dealing with is a sleeping dragon inside that building. And when you open it up, you're going to wake them up. So um, this is where it requires some discipline. One, uh, one thing, too, yes, uh, Bill, if I could, um, with, the, with the portable monitor thing as well, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of times we can just throw one in service and, and assume that we're making a big impact on the fire. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things that come into play with it too. Like if you don't understand the building construction, if you don't understand where you're putting that stream, we can flow a lot of water inside a building and have and, and it can have very little effect if we're not putting it in the right place. So um, it's kind of something too. We see that a lot. How many times have we been in a fire where you see a some sort of a master stream in play and it's you know going over top of the building or in one side and out the other making no impact so um something too to to think about is uh is that stream being effective uh, for what we need it to be because we reach the point of diminishing returns very quickly i think um god who said it, there's a four problems with master streams uh, the weight of the water uh the reaction of the device itself uh, and God knows we've seen that with uh, elevated master streams that are pinned, that can either follow the fly section or stay back for uh, uh, what we call a rescue mode. Um, hitting debris. And there was one more. Oh, you're getting hit yourself. Um, we cut a trench cut in a... Uh, a large shopping center that had a rain roof uh, early in my career with Miami Day. I was a lieutenant on engine seven at the time. And uh, this fire, the only way to get to it was to cut it and attack it from above. In retrospect, we would have used resin distributors, and I don't think we even had them at that time. So we're cutting and we're stripping, and the fire's roaring up out of the trench as we cut it, roaring up, and we directed. I'll never forget this. Uh, ladder 17 has got their elevated master stream, and we motioned them over, bring it over, bring it over, hit this the fire in the trench, and it hit our K-12 saw and knocked it off of the roof, and I thought, we just killed somebody. We just killed somebody. And um, you know there's plenty of cases where a, an elevated master stream or a ground-mounted master stream, roof tiles, glass. Uh, I watched a fire of a roofing fire in an apartment complex near Fort Lauderdale where they were hitting these rolls of felt and knocking them off the roof like they were nothing. So uh, there's a lot of power behind a, uh, a master stream, whether it's elevated or not. And I, I think part of the training with master streams has to be that, uh, you know, just like any other powerful force, if it gets loose, somebody's going get, to get hurt. So, um, do you have any, Chief Shaw, do you yes, have sir. any guidelines? Because you don't see many departments, I know mine doesn't, have any type of guidelines uh, or SOP for the safe operation of uh, master streams? Um, I think we have the generally accepted uh, procedures for it, you know, having, or I, I backtrack something, we're fortunate where I work, it, we have, you know, you get 60 people on a, a routine fire, and two of those are safety officers solely dedicated to exactly what you're talking to, is having the, the awareness and the eyes and look at certain things and say, hey, you're too close to a parapet, or you know, you're where your position's not good. Um, but no, they have set procedures that are outside just the regular industry standards, especially if we're talking about if we're going to use a tower ladder or things of that nature um, or within a distance of power lines. You know, hopefully a lot of common sense prevails in that. 
Um, but no, we don't have anything that's really preset. And you know, I think the the bigger issue, I think James uh, touched on this a moment ago, is is we always come back to you know breaking this conventional attack operations or considerations and understanding is that you can use that portable monitor for a lot of things. Uh, it's very effective. The same as using a tower ladder. You have a million dollar tower ladder. If you have never taken that thing down to below zero and put that up into a space and put an enormous amount of water onto a fire and you slowly think it's something to put up really high and put through a hole in a roof and wash their contents out the front door, you shouldn't be riding that tower ladder because uh, it really is a highly effective tool if you know how to use it the right way. And that second part is really knowing how to interpret nozzle feedback. You are flowing water into a space. You should be getting some measure of immediate feedback that's telling you whether you're effective or ineffective. And I think about these church fires, and I had to look this number up, but like the Notre, Notre Dame fire, uh, when that burned, that was 55 acres of hundreds of years old oak burning. Your, your uh, portable monitor is not going to do anything with that. You know what your fuel load is and understand what the expectation is and then applying the right tools for it, uh, it you know, is, is that first pivotal part of us placing that stone uh, to build that foundation for success on the fire ground. Do any of you guys, do any of your departments utilize the term doubtful in either the initial or an ongoing size up? Oh, when I talk about Sam, I do. Doubtful. <laughs> doubtful is going to win any uh, beauty contest. Uh, I mean, I, it, I it's don't obviously think it's Sam on The Bachelor anytime soon. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's I think it's a yeah, a long-standing return from the FDNY. We've adopted it into uh, what our aide does at a 20-minute timer, uh, and they read essentially you know almost a a Mad Libs fill-in script that goes back to our dispatch that. You know, all the chiefs and anyone listening knows what exactly it was. And it essentially breaks down the number of lines are deployed, status of searches, and it will give it some determination of the fire, whether it remains doubtful or the fire is out or, you know, um, and then they, they finish with a statement. But it is clearly something we stole from the FDNY, whether it sounded cool or we just like the script. One of my favorite videos is a fire in Detroit at a family dollar. And this was a department uh, like in Canada where there are no promotional exams. So it's a double-edged sword. You do end up with some very experienced people in high command positions. And this, uh, this, this chief arrived and it's a typical dollar store loaded with um, the perfect storm of fuel that is in racks. All the cheap stuff made in China is just wrapped in plastic, and uh, he has smoke showing. Doesn't look that bad, but I'm sure in his experience, he knows by the time that they get water on this fire, uh, that it, it's they're going to have more than they can handle, in, in, at least in terms of risk versus benefit. So he says, um, a doubtful. We have a doubtful. Uh, so basically, what I interpret that to mean is. Hey, boys, doesn't matter what we're going to do here. The outcome is going to be the same. So let's don't get hurt. Let's don't get killed. Let's get the water supply secured, get the sticks in the air, and let nature take its course. Basically, you're saying, hey, it's doubtful that we're going to be able to control this fire, and it's not worth the risk without having to say that directly over the radio. But it's a, uh, I, I think it's a term, I wish that our department used it. Uh, Chicago, I know years ago, used to say that there might be more on this, which means you better start pulling those box cards out and figuring out what the next assignment is. Nowadays, it would be, you better get on the computer-aided dispatch and seeing who the next companies are gonna be and start to arrange your change of orders because this is going to get bigger rather than just pressing the panic button all at once and asking for two or three extra alarms at one time. What are we doing on time? We got about six minutes. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to the our brothers in, uh, and sisters in Australia. They have a, just an absolutely desperate, heartbreaking situation there. Um, with their wildfires. And uh, it's 
reminiscent of what we see in, in, in California. Uh, their wildlife and their domestic livestock has been absolutely, totally devastated. Uh, I understand that they've got some species of wildlife that could become extinct because of this. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's a heartbreak to see uh, how devastating uh, wildfires can be. And, you know, we think about how far we have come uh, with our technology. Uh, with everything, our protective clothing, our SCBAs, thermal imaging, go on and on and on and on. But at the end of the day, if the fire has the upper hand, they will win the day. And there's really not much we can do about it. I guess I could draw a comparison with, with us trying to stop a, a Category 5 hurricane. It's not going to be done. So... Um, it's just my my heart goes out to those folks, and um, I can only hope that, um, like in California, um, and I I have no firsthand knowledge of this, but I do have first knowledge of what we did in South Florida, and we did change our building code, and because we have hurricanes, we have high winds, and torrential rain, and wind driven rain, and I'm not saying that they didn't do this, but I would hope that if building codes uh, would make a difference, uh, for instance, uh, cement board siding rather than flat board or vinyl siding, uh, definitely sh uh, shake shingles on a roof. Uh, we've known historically that's not a good idea with wildfires. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with our, our brothers and sisters in Australia, if there will be any changes made to the building code and you know just controlling vegetation in general it is a uh, it's a huge problem okay we're going to close this out james i want to thank you again brother and would you tell us what you're teaching at fdic this year yeah at fdic i'm teaching i think it's at 3 30 on wednesday and i'm doing my mm -hmm. class facts not fear where i look at um some of the stuff with lightweight and engineered construction and uh, maybe some of the stuff that we as a fire service worry about um, that we shouldn't be worrying about and, and some of the stuff that we should be worrying about. So just trying to put it into perspective. Well, I attended a class by a young James Johnson and uh, was highly impressed. And uh, that was how many years ago? And uh, you have established yourself, distinguished yourself at, as quite an authority. Um, I know we weren't supposed supposed to go into a big dissertation about our background with uh, the regular group, but uh, you do come from the construction trades. And I think you do know how to swing a hammer, James. And you definitely know how to use that comb because <laughs> that, that hair. So, um, I was waiting for the hair comment. Yeah, you know it. But you know a baseball cap like Sam. <laughs> Jason, anything to close out? Yeah, just a couple things, uh, just considering church fires or places of worship that, that I've learned over the years is one, um, you never know where they're going to be. And like I said, they're always stubborn. And so I think it's really important to have some tactical patience before you just charge it in any any part of that building so that you know what you're dealing with. And the other thing that, that I've learned, too, is always keep in the back of your head. It's not uncommon for these fires, no matter what kind of building it is, but because it's a place of worship that the beast set fire. And those can be especially dangerous for us. An advanced fire upon arrival or fire in containers that would uh, ignite after we make entry. Uh, remember, uh, it is very common with incendiary fires to have more than one fire. So good point, Jason. Uh, uh chief dan any closing comments uh no thanks again man thanks for hosting thanks for uh always uh putting this on i think it's always important for us to get together and, and, and discuss these type of things and i i guess the, the 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 resounding thing that stick in my head is with my uh, astute friend larry schultz will often say is know your building stock uh i mean you got to know your building stock you go in the area which you serve uh and along those same lines is you got to have the sets and reps to be able to recognize the situation and then be able to apply the right strategy and tactics. That's the key to our success on the fire ground. But never lose focus. And we say this in all occupancy type fires we run. Never, ever forget the fire always gets a vote.
No matter what you yep. do, the buyer always gets a vote. And, and you got to be 51%. Yeah, I mean, oh. you got to be ready for it. You got to have you know, the ability to not become so complacent or arrogant. Uh, and, you know, if you win at something that you always got to think about to yourself is you don't worry about what you just won. You always worry about the president and what's going to happen next. Uh, and that is the buyer will always get a vote. But always a what pleasure. You teaching at FDIC, Dan? Uh, teaching Monday, 25 Survive, the commercial building with my uh, brother from another mother, Doug. Um, and then we're doing a new class on Thursday, which is Doug, myself, and Frank Viscuso, who's keynoting, uh, called Lead, Survive, and Thrive. And it's kind of a leadership class. Good. Jason, I'm sorry. I didn't ask you. What are you teaching at FDIC? Uh, first thing Monday morning at 8 o'clock, uh, since Doug and Dan are on, it'd probably be a quiet room. <laughs> but uh, uh, for, first yeah, we'll be, You mean we're not going to be in there to yell at you? I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, first do decision-making for the company officer. And that's a four-hour workshop? It is, yeah. I've got a workshop. I think it's on Tuesday, uh, operations for newly promoted company officers. And uh, Thursday is uh, a classroom session on uh, standpipe operations. How about you, Samuel? What will you be teaching at FDIC? Um, I'm fortunate to uh, go back and forth with uh, Chief Larry Schultz in the class uh, Learning from uh, fire common fire ground mistakes, and we uh, we try to mix it up a little bit from the uh, company officer perspective and the expectations of the uh, incident commander. Um, a lot of it is how we uh, coordinate for the fire. Uh, unfortunately, in two hours, we can't really get into a lot of the individual tactics. But uh, we just we talk about the mindsets and the communication factor that needs to be addressed prior to responding. Um, and then to close this out, I, I would basically say just um, treat, treat church fires like a high rise. Uh, don't get caught up in what you can see. Uh, we talked about vacant churches, but what we didn't discuss is growing churches. Um, so growing churches are going to have those add-ons. Um, if it's more of a, a conventional church, you're going to have a lot of uh, unconventional compartmentation behind the uh, main stage. Uh, where the preacher delivers, uh, you have sound floors, so you have some unique uh, construction features in there that are going to hide or mask some of our problems. Hopefully, uh, our discussion uh, will raise the awareness level uh, of our brothers and sisters to get out of the firehouse and uh, get into their districts and find out what uh, their building stock is to quote was the chief. Uh, Larry Schultz, uh, two guys that I really admire, uh, and they're both uh, friends of yours, Dan and, and Sam, is Larry Schultz and Ricky Riley. And if you ever get an opportunity to see either of these fine fire officers and gentlemen, they bring so much experience, uh, so much knowledge to the table. And they do it in such a humble way. They're just regular guys. But um, I, uh, I, it wouldn't be FDIC for me if I don't go to see uh, John Norman. I don't see uh, um, Larry Schultz, uh, Ricky Riley. It's just because um, every time I see them, uh, I learn something new. Uh, because they are consummate students of the fire service. So. Uh, until next month, we. by the way, I know what the topic is going to be. We're going to have two uh, really good guests on next month. It's going to be uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, Jimmy Davis, Lieutenant uh, Training Officer from the Chicago Fire Department. Uh, he is going to be talking about uh, controlling the occupants. You have to control a high-rise fire. you got to control its system, and you have to control its occupants and uh, the role of their fire investigation team. Uh, we are also going to have on Chief uh, Danny Sheridan from the FDNY, and he's going to be talking about, uh, and we've touched on this in the past, the, uh, the viability, the practicality of um, the protect and place strategy. So uh, I'm looking forward to a, a great session next month. It will be the second Wednesday of February. Uh, and until Next month, fellas, thank you all so much for participating. And for our brothers and sisters out there, uh, thanks for joining us. 
and may God bless you and protect you in our most noble profession. Is that good, Joe?